Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Brown. I'm the VP of Product Management here at Onshape, and I'm with uh, today Christopher Gromick. Chris, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Chris, Senior Product Manager of Advanced Development in the Office of the CTO, and working very closely with Greg and the rest of the Onshape team to bring simulation to you. That's right. So today is a very exciting day. Um, we're talking to you about our new Onshape simulation product uh, that we announced and uh, launched last week. Um, so today what we're going to do is um, talk about Onshape simulation, of course, but before we get to that, uh, just a couple of words about Onshape and the year 2022, uh, because it's been an amazing year for the product. Uh, we've unbelievably and greatly expanded uh, Onshape's footprint, and by footprint I mean the areas of the product uh, that it can extend to in, in, for product development. Uh, if you remember at the beginning of the year or early in the year, we introduced Onshape Render Studio for photorealistic rendering. Uh, we introduced PCB Studio for ECAD, MCAD workflows. Uh, we introduced the Arena Onshape Connection for PLM, um, the best in class for, for both cloud-based um, PLM and, and cloud-native uh, uh, CAD and PDM. We also announced the acquisition of Cloud Milling, which is going to be an upcoming product uh, for CAM in, uh, in, in Onshape. Uh, and so all of this has gone to, to create the, uh, you know, the, the world's best cloud native agile product development platform in Onshape. But today it's all about introducing Onshape simulation, something that Chris and I have personally been very, very invested in and are very excited to talk about and show you today. So it's a pretty simple um, story that we're going to talk about today. That is, what is Onshape Simulation? And then we're going to show you how it works. Uh, Chris is going to talk a little bit about how it does work as well and, and why we indeed uh, created this, uh, this program, Onshape Simulation. Um, but without any further ado, um, let's get into that. So what is Onshape Simulation? Uh, or in other words, finally, an intuitive simulation tool specifically for designers. That's what it is. Onshape Simulation is a decision support tool for designers that's built right into their Onshape workflows. And it provides structured simulation as a natural and intuitive part of assembly design. Now you're going to see this and hear us talk about this uh, throughout the rest of the, the seminar. Uh, but the key features of Onshape Simulation are that it offers the simplest possible workflow of any structural simulation application ever. That's a big claim, but you're going to see that live. Um, secondly, assembly connectivity is automatically understood. This is a really, really important thing in able to, to make it usable uh, for our design community. Thirdly, Onshape simulation is an intrinsic part of the Onshape modeling environment. And further to that, there is nothing to install. There's nothing to down download, no drivers that need to be kept up to date. Uh, any, um, any web browser that can run Onshape can run Onshape simulation. It uses the same cloud native GPU powered computational resources as Onshape. And in fact, you're going to hear me say this a lot, that Onshape simulation is Onshape. There's no separation here. Uh, and so you're going to see this and, and hear us talk a lot about this um, throughout the rest of the, the seminar. So why did we make Onshape Simulation? Now, if we go back through history, you know, simulation has always been a really important and integral part of uh, design uh, throughout the ages. Uh, so if we go all the way back to the 50s, people were doing modeling and simulation, uh, perhaps for the first uh, flights into space. Uh, so modeling and simulation tools have existed for a long, long time. And the hardware and the systems that they run on uh, have changed as generations have changed from the early uh, mainframe systems uh, using punch cards, um, you know, largely as their input, uh, through to the workstation age and then into the, the PC age where you had standalone tools running uh, monolithic executables on those workstations or, or Windows PCs. But now we're into the cloud age. Uh, there's a new generation of people, newer generation of engineers, uh, and, and the pressures on those engineers about fast time to market evaluating different concepts and working in an agile way are harder now than, than ever before. So simulation tools as well as the hardware have to keep up with that change. So further on to this, you know, and, and 
the, the real question is, is why have we made this today in 2022? Um, I've been talking about designer simulation. In fact, I counted up for more than 25 years now. So what's different today and, and um, than, than back then? And I'll throw it over to Chris because you've also been a practitioner uh, on both sides of the development and usage of, of simulation tools. So uh, what do you have to think about this? Well, um, yeah, in fact, you know, before I started in the software industry, I was an aerospace engineer working for the Boeing company. And that's where I cut my teeth, so to speak, on design <laughs> analysis and learned firsthand the, the pleasure and pain of doing good work. Um, but really the tools that I had at my disposal were not really what I wanted. And with this product, I think we finally got an opportunity to build the tools that we wish we could have been using ourselves. Right. Um, and that's not to say that people haven't tried valiantly over those seven decades that you just showed from the 1950s. But it might be to say that CAD designers uh, offer very particularly difficult requirements. And some of them are listed here. First and foremost, it has to be easy to set up so easy that it doesn't feel like it's a different experience than your CAD modeling in the first place, because no designer wakes up and says, I want to spend all day setting up this simulation. You know, they wake up and say, I want to spend all day making a better product. And simulation is a part of that. And the yeah. part it is, is it informs those design steps. But the information is only good if it's meaningful. So there have been attempts in the past to make it easy to set up. But along the way, you make simplifying assumptions, and some of those simplify out the meaning. So that's a delicate balancing act, one which I think we've done perfectly well. Now, that information should feed into your uh, design decisions, but it only is useful if it feeds at a pace that keeps up with your design. And that's where the third requirement to be agile in your product development workflow is very important. And that leads into, well, the cost benefit analysis of doing something extra on top of what you're already doing. And that comes in terms of time and monetary costs. Any software is going to uh, use either of those two, um, and, but they can't be prohibitively expensive for anyone in our design community because we don't want them to be shut out from the, from the usage. So on the right here, we've got a couple graphics that kind of play to an old adage about simulation. I'm sure Greg's heard it or said it a million times, which is that simulation is FEA, but FEA doesn't stand for finite element analysis. It stands for fast, easy, and accurate. But you can only pick two in the past. And if you didn't pick accurate, you weren't being a good engineer, which meant you either were slow or difficult, and no one likes that choice. So with Onshape, um, specifically because of the platform that it's built on, we're able to choose all three. If it hadn't been built uh, on a ground up, pure SaaS architecture where we can deliver to you the most cutting edge novel simulation techniques and powerful GPUs available on the market, this might not be possible. But today it is, and hopefully we'll all benefit because of it. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, Chris, that you know, this really is the confluence of technologies um, that has only you know, become available to us uh, you know, with Onshake's platform, uh, the cloud, the GPU, the, the numerical analysis techniques, all of it is coming together nicely for us. So, so, so let's take a look at how things would have been conventionally done, all right? And this is a workflow down at the bottom that everyone probably is familiar with. On the left, you have a fully defined assembly. On the right, you have the simulation results that you so desperately want. In between, there's work to get that simulation set up, okay? Most notably for structural analysis, you're going to have to add a load. But there's other unnecessary things here in the dark gray. For instance, we think that it's a little redundant to have to reassign part interactions for your simulation if you've already defined your assembly. If I told you once, why should I have to tell you all over again? On the other side, as a designer, I don't want to be focusing my attention on what are my mesh settings or my solver convergent ratios, all right? I want to be focused on, is this part going to work for the usage that I'm de designing for? And if not, what's the next step to get there? So we tried to take a clean sheet of paper and imagine the simplest designer workflow ever. And that's above here in green. That's as simple as it gets. On the left, you still have the fully defined assembly. On the right, you have the simulation results. And in the middle, there's the one thing that we can't do on your behalf, which is decide where to put the load, because at the end of the day, it's still your structural analysis. That's right. 
I think that the workflow gets even better as you use those results uh, to inform your next design step because we built Onshape simulation directly into the same data model as the rest of the document, single source of data. Any change will automatically propagate into the simulation results. So there's no going back and redoing your simulation steps like you might have in the past. That loop just updates. And in my opinion, this is finally the, the tool that as a designer I would want to use. But we don't just have to take my word for it. Uh, Greg and I have been running an extensive early visibility program for months now, and this is some of the feedback. Um, yeah, no, I, was, I, I want to say uh, yeah, big thanks to Chris and his team for uh, for running this early visibility, visibility program. I know that some of you on this call will have been part of that, and we thank you for your efforts in, in making the product uh, what it is. Um, interestingly, you know, we've just pulled a, a couple of quotes, and there's been many, many more that we could pull up here, but you know, the, the comments coming back about the speed, you know, this gets done in seconds. Uh, somebody else was saying that previously in FEA, I had just done a single part. I was surprised that we could set up an assembly so easily. You know, that's really uh, fulfilling to us because that was absolutely our, <laughs> the, the, the goal we set out to achieve. And finally, the one here, which has really sums it all up, love the simplicity. So, it sounds simple, and it is simple, but before we get to show you how it actually works, let's talk about some of the nuts and bolts, all right? Your work will still start in a part studio, because after all, you have to have parts in order to simulate them, and you must remember to assign materials. If we don't know what the part is made of, we can't tell you how it's gonna respond, okay? Then the rest of your work, as Greg alluded, is done in the assembly. It's an assembly-centric simulation, and we encourage you to add as much fidelity and richness to that model as possible, and you'll start by adding mates. Or not, actually. Uh, you know, the technology underneath the hood implicitly derives all these simulation connections from the mates. And since they're implicit derivations, we can assign some default settings on your behalf to make that easier. We'll get to that in the demos, and hopefully you'll see the power in that. Then you'll add a load and click to view the results. And your work is more or less done. Our work, however, is not. At this point, we'll provision the most powerful GPUs that Amazon Web Services has to offer. We'll individually inspect each of the parts for their topology and any neighboring interactions and relative topology as well. Convert those bodies to a mesh and begin the solve. Now, you won't have to wait until that solve is complete to start getting useful results because we're going to stream the very first useful uh, converged solution back to your client so that you're making design decisions as quickly as we have information to give you. But that first pass might not be the best, so we're gonna adaptively refine until we fully converged on the whole solution. And then you can inspect it as to your heart's content, or share it to a colleague, or open up the simulation panel, add more simulations and reconfigure your loads the way you would part studio configurations or assembly configurations. And if you've noticed, I haven't introduced any new concept here, apart from adding a load, that you aren't already familiar with. Our goal was that if you already know how to use Onshape assemblies, you've already got the full training manual for Onshape simulation, and you can get started right away. So without further ado, Greg, how about you get started on some demos? Yeah, so I mean, exactly. At this point, I just want to remind you again, because I have to get a certain quota of saying this, that on-shape simulation is on-shape. So that's really summarizing what Chris said there. And just to reiterate uh, for anyone who might have just joined, I'm seeing people still joining. It's an incredible number of people on the call. I'm, I'm really, really happy to see so many people interested. Um, the stuff that's in gray here isn't anything that you have to worry about. It's nothing you have to do. Uh, this is all happening uh, behind the scenes and it's really the superpower of, of what we're, uh, we're talking about here today. Um, so yeah, as Chris said, I'm going to, um, to switch over now and, uh, and, and show you how this all works. Um, let me do that here. And I'm going to do that with a, an, an interesting um, demonstration. Um, and I'm going to start with a project that I've been working on here in the desk that's just out of sight. Uh, I'm working on my, uh, my, son's, I mean, my, my, son's, my son's radio control car, <laughs> definitely not mine. Um, and uh, I'm looking at this, uh, this roll cage on the back, and I'm, I'm changing the design. I'm going to make this a little bit differently. Uh, so I've been using Onshape's um, part modeling capabilities. Uh, I'm in a part studio here, and I'm actually using framework capabilities. So you know, more and more of things I'm going to show you are just the interweaving of all of the good parts and all the power of Onshape. 
So I've made a part studio here. Uh, I made a further derived part studio of this where I started adding a little bit more detail about how things are going to connect together. So again, I'm in a part studio and I want to get some early insight and, and feedback on, on you know, maybe some of the material choices or maybe some of the fillets or these gussets, whether I need these gussets here or not. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create an assembly uh, because as Chris said, you know, everything happens in an assembly. You create the shapes in a part studio, you assign materials in a part studio, but everything happens uh, in, in an assembly. So I'm going to bring all of those parts in like this. And I have a look at them. And there's many, many different ways. And during the rest of these demonstrations, you're going to see us use lots of and unveil lots of different techniques for how these things are going to join together. But for this very, very first, my first simulation, I'm going to use a group. I'm going to group everything together. Again, this is nothing new. This is already stuff that you know how to do uh, in Onshape. The next thing I'm going to do is just right click on this and say, well, let's fix it because this is fixed to the rest of the chassis. It's part of the, the, you know, the, the rest of the model. The only thing that's new at this point is the ability or the need to, to add a load. So I'm going to put a force. And in fact, this is a little bit subtle and different in that I'm going to put a force on the whole body. A lot of what we do and a lot of what we encourage in Onshape Simulation is to keep things very, very physical, to avoid abstractions. Um, so, you know, in, a, in, a, in addition to the things that you already know how to do, which is manipulate, make connectors, uh, enter in things with units, um, and, and you see it's all very, very familiar. Now, at this point, you know, I've got different modes that I can use to, to examine this model. Um, for example, I can go to over here and have a look at this in a translucent mode. And I can see I've done a little bit of a bad thing by putting this, driving this uh, threaded hole insert very, very close to this boundary. The point I'm making is that you can flip between shaded mode, translucent mode, but now you can also start looking at simulation results right when you're here. Like there's no separate environment that we have to invoke. There's no separate tab or, or, or a companion uh, application that we need to invoke. We just ask Onshape to start giving the results back. And within a couple of seconds, um, the results start coming in like this. And I don't have to wait. As Chris said, I don't have to wait for this. I can already start doing some useful things. And the first thing with any simulation that you should do is to check the validity or the direction or the magnitude, just the, the sanity of the loads that you've applied. So I'm looking at displacements here, I'm animating it, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, that looks the direction that I intended. That's pretty good. You can, it's vastly deformed, so I don't have to, I don't have to use that such a def deformation scale. Um, I can just roll my mouse over and see, well, that's 3.4 millimeters. That sounds about right. You know, I've, I've got, I'm a designer. I've got this intuition about what I'm kind of expecting here. I can also start to look at uh, things like the, the stresses. So I've got a very, very interactive way of, of dealing with this. Uh, I can just run my, my mouse down the, the legend and start to look at where the hotspots uh, spots, hot spots for this uh, von Mises stress um, result is. Again, I can animate this. Uh, where we're all looking very good. And meanwhile, uh, you know, we've, re we've achieved a converged solution. Um, so now we can have a look at some additional results, uh, such as, oh, we'll stop that, such as the safety factor. Now, a safety factor is very, very useful for me in this early stage of analysis because it just gives me a no-go or a go decision on, on things. And if this safety factor is less than one, it means that the material has gone past its yield point. And that's not a good position to be in uh, when you're trying to design something like this. So we go back to the past studio and just continue this process. So this is kind of a, the very, very easiest, um, but very powerful and, 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 uh, and meaningful way of, uh, of getting your first um, simulation done. Now we can move to uh, something a little bit different. Okay, so this is simple geometry, of course, but there's some complexities in here that we are going to start to unveil uh, some, as I said, superpowers inside Onshape Simulation. So this, again, we're in an assembly, and this already has a couple of interesting mates. There's a couple of fasten uh, mates. So I'm going to suppress this one, and you'll see in the middle that there's actually a, a sliding and rotating, or what we call a cylindrical mate um, in the middle there. That's very, very important because this is a rocker arm that is physically positioned on a journal bearing. And I want to know the stress in this arm. So I want to 
model this as accurately as possible for my early insight um, and analysis here. Okay, so I've got my assembly, I've done my mates. This is all the stuff that you already know how to do. And you already know this because I've given you the training class in the previ previous example. I'm going to put a force on this body. I'm going to select or create a mate connector down here. Um, mate, that's 600 newtons. I could put pounds force or any other unit that I uh, that was appropriate for here. Uh, and now we have, um, you know, the, the check mark here saying yes, we're we're ready to look at results. Um, so let's do that. So as the results start coming in here, again, you know, what I would do is um, is look at the deformation. So this looks like it's again. I've got the load going in the right direction. That's always good. That's always a good sign. Um, and let's uh, let's put back to stresses. We're nearly there. Again, I can play with those stresses. Okay. So here is our um, our model, and you can see the really important thing is that the model is allowed to or this this rocker arm is allowed to rotate about this component, but it's also sliding up and down on it. The um, the interesting thing is, is that a lot of designer simulation tools over the years have been created with some limitations built in, uh, in order to make it easy enough um, for designers to create their first simulations. And like I always like to say or point out to people, it's not, is that by doing this, uh, by doing what people have done in the past and making it easy to use, it's also made it easier to do bad CAE. Now. A bad CAE situation here was if we completely fused these components together. Now I can show you that and can show the uh, the, um, the 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 difference between having it rotate and slide properly as the as the uh, as the assembly intends uh, versus having it fully fused. But before I get to that, I want to point out a really interesting thing, and it's uh, like any good demonstration. There's someone behind the curtain uh, helping me out. And Onshape's collaboration cues are very, very powerful. Uh, again, this is not just an Onshape simulation demonstration. This is an Onshape demonstration, right? Because Onshape simulation is Onshape. So what I'm going to do is peel back the curtain a little bit to my other browser. And you'll see there that I've got this part studio turned on, but I'm following Chris. Now, Chris is working. Uh, I don't know where Chris is. It doesn't really matter. He could be in Japan or Australia for all I care. Um, but I'm not using the, the, the my mouse anymore. I'm just watching Chris work. And we're having this conversation perhaps over Slack or over some kind of um, collaboration saying that I think what if you, can you suggest some changes to me that might make this a little bit stronger? I'm a little bit worried about the stresses in the side there. What are you doing there, Chris? Well, Greg, do you think, uh, you know, I, I know that you've been running the simulation. Do you think that this will be thick enough or should we just uh, try it and see how it turns out? Let's try and see. We're early in the stages here. All right. Now, as soon as Chris commits his change from perhaps he's in Michigan, right? Um, I can see my simulation, which is here in Boston, um, changing. So, and and the, the results are automatically refreshing. So this is truly collaborative, real-time simulation, uh, the likes of which you probably, well, you would never have seen before because this isn't possible in any other system. It's only possible because of the cloud, the true cloud native way that, that we're working. There were no files transferred because there are no files in Onshape. Um, I didn't have to create uh, in, in a separate dot extra version or dot try this dot something dot something. Um, we're just working off the, the data here. And as Chris keeps changing this, um, you know, we could con continue our collaboration if you wanted to add a fillet or, or, or move that face back because that looks like a little bit of a tight uh, thing in here. So I'm, I'm looking at this, looking at these stresses uh, with my mouse over and we're doing a, uh, a you know, again, a, a completely real-time um, collaborative simulation session where, you know, I've called in an expert, I've called in my lifeline saying, look, I have to release this product by the end of today. Um, how can you help me out? So with that, you know, I think that's the, uh, you know, the first couple of demonstrations here. Oh, actually, no, it's not. There's one more. Um, because if you do want to fuse all this together, <laughs> I want to show you this one. I think it's, it's worth showing uh, and just to see what the difference is. And I'm going to, in the same time, introduce one new concept uh, for the user interface, which is the simulation panel. Now, the simulation panel slides out. And Chris is going to go into a lot of this 
uh, through the simulations and loads and, and other things. But I just want to call out the default method I'm using to create these connections is just to use the mates. Right? If I wanted to, I could say, let's just bond everything that's touching together. I'm going to watch now what happens and you know the comparison between the, the, what you saw before versus what you now see after. Now, this is an egregious case of bad CAE because this doesn't represent anything that would happen in real life unless you you know somehow bonded the bearing to the uh, to the rocker arm uh, or, or somehow it, it ended up that way but you can see now that as i animate it the only deformation and the only strain is occurring on this side over here so of course this is an exaggeration um, but it goes to show you that sometimes bad cae could you lead you to bad decision making all right and that's what um that's what we're avoiding here and if i go back to just using the mates. Oh, by the way, you see that was so quick because the results had already been cached. Uh, it just displayed those results back again. So I'm going to um, pause here and pass over to Chris because he's going to dig into some of the um, uh, some of the other more probably esoteric and interesting and powerful sides of um, of the simulation uh, inside of Jake. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Greg. Yeah. Okay. So, for our first demonstration here of how it works underneath uh, the hood or behind the curtain, as Greg said, we're starting with some very simple geometry that's going to hopefully illustrate some powerful concepts. All right. I've got this Deco Beco system. It's made <laughs> of four parts, okay, with three fastened mates in between. All right. I'm going to load this body. And I'm going to load the entire body, okay, such that it just pulls straight out. And then all I have to do is click show results and I'm off away. What I want you to uh, recognize, though, is that this load, this loader body is the entire influence of where that load is originated. And everything is connected to one another, all right? It's connected to one another because this mate dictates here that these two parts, anywhere they touch, should be fastened. But what happens if I wanted to do something more nuanced than that? For instance, maybe I only want these to connect over this middle prong. In that situation, I can use a little more fidelity to this model. And when I go into this mate, I have a new option under simulation connection, where I can limit this interaction not over anywhere that the two touch, but just over a single face that I might select. The eagle-eyed would notice that this is already a configurable option and I've already configured it. So when I go back to my results, all I have to do is switch between my fully fused and my center prong configuration. The simulation automatically recognizes the change to the assembly definition and updates accordingly. And these results will show that sure enough, I'm only attached through the center and the top and bottom are free to move apart. Now that's all well and good and a certain level of accuracy and fidelity that we can offer. But we can do one more because those surfaces don't have to necessarily be associated with either of these two parts. And indeed, if I go over here to an exploded view, I can show you that we've actually got two separate surface bodies that are gonna act as little glue patches or tape in between these two parts. And using the same mechanism as before, if I go and just change my configuration such that it now references those two surface patches and update my results, we'll see that the center is moved, is free to move apart, but the top and bottom are connected and only under those two areas. Of course, on shape simulation is on shape, so I can isolate my results here. I can see these two pulling apart. I can see the areas where they're connected, where they're not, and everything looks well and good. Okay, now this was simple geometry. All right, we're gonna move to a little bit more complex geometry and show you just how powerful these body-to-body -body interactions really are, because it almost doesn't matter what the body's topology looks like. So here's something that you might not see anywhere else, all right? I've got facet geometry, uh, that I brought in from an external tool. This is a generally designed uh, triple clamp at the top of either a motorcycle or a mountain bike, all right? And this is clearly not analytic geometry surfaces. 
at least not everywhere. Using Onshape's mixed modeling tools, I was able to bore out clean interfaces at all of the intersecting, intersecting components, all right? But the rest is all just STL import. Now, it doesn't matter to the simulation. All of this is recognized as before. If I click to show results, I will get them shortly, all right? As this goes through, I'd like you to recognize that this is really unique to Onshape, and it's part of the reason why Greg likes to say Onshape simulation is Onshape, because we did it. All right. Oh, I, I think you were about to say it yourself. It's because we didn't want to have to distinguish that this part is okay for simulation or this part isn't. If it didn't work with everything, we weren't going to make it work uh, for just one. So this is coming along pretty well. I want to go back and open this simulation panel. Here we can see my, my single linear static definition. It's in progress, so I see the progress bar. At this point, I can change my color scheme, all right? I'm kind of old school, so I still like the rainbow look, but I've got Viridus, red, blue, and plasma looks pretty good here too, all right? Now that my simulation results are about to converge, I'm gonna show you one that I particularly like, all right, which is the sine von Mises. And in plasma, it looks really good because I can see exactly the areas of a compression and tension and the dividing line in between. So Chris, can I just jump in? Uh, there's a question, there was a question around those color schemes um, and you know, just providing, uh, and I can sort of paraphrase uh, a little bit, but do we, you know, you've seen the Viridis, uh, that, that first color scheme is a little bit of a default. Um, is there a reason why we're using that? Yes, actually, there's been a lot of user research around Beardus, uh, and it's been found to have the most uh, applicability to anyone, regardless of their color blindness or color sightedness. Not only that, but the variation in color and uh, tone is uniform across the spectrum so that you get a visual impact for how much stress or deformation there is, uh, as opposed to you know the rainbow that I'm used to, which doesn't really uh, highlight in exactly the areas that are actually more important, it might highlight areas that are less important but visually impactful just because of the colors. Okay, that thanks, cool. That was a good question. All right, All right. yeah. Um, so yeah. here we've been hey, running. If anybody, sorry, but if anyone else has any questions, there is a there's a situation or there's a facility in this um, go to meeting uh, webinar where you can ask questions, and I'm seeing them. Um, and so please keep coming, uh, them coming in, and I'll ask them uh, when I can, and I'll answer them when I can, yeah. So I'm gonna, right now we've only been running with single loads, but I wanna illustrate that we can add as many loads as we want. Here, this load direction, I'm gonna pin off of a mate connector, all right, which gives me a local coordinate system, and then I'm off to the races, all right. In my simulation panel, I now have both of those, but maybe I actually only wanted to run the moment on it separately, all right? So here I add a simulation, and now I can add, I can suppress or unsuppress accordingly, all right? If I jump to simulation two, this will kick off, and now I'm simulating just the moment as opposed to the force. Now, if I wanted to simulate both at the same time, I just add another simulation, both of those load objects transfer over because it's part of the definition of the assembly and here i might want to simulate the most restrictive uh case of all so i can go in and type whatever i want for this load doesn't have to match uh the previous configurations all right and if i'm really slick i may have already set in my variable table uh the load magnitudes for each of these components and I have. So in this, I'm just going to recognize that and apply that here. You'll notice that as I was typing this, simulation didn't stop running. It just kept on updating because the two operations shouldn't compete with one another. And once I've fully defined that, then I can switch over to simulation three and it's off and running as well. You'll notice that my little glyphs have updated with the orientation of my loads. Magnitudes are found here, deduced from the individual components, and everything is in sync. 
Okay. Now, I, I just I think I just unleashed something amazing. There's there's literally dozens and dozens and dozens of really great questions coming in. Okay. <laughs> so um, Chris, keep going, and I'm uh, compiling a list in my head here. <laughs> All right. Well, feel free to cut in with any good questions. Um, okay. Oh, maybe we can ask one right now. Can you change the defamation to a, a one a unit a unit scale? Yeah. Sure. I'm going to. Wait until I get some initial results here. Oh, okay, okay. Yep. All right. Yep. And then I can change this to just Unity. And yep. instead of, if you don't like to see the little animation, you can just show deformation. And this is this is the one-to-one -one scale of what these loads would look like if you applied them to your motorcycle. Great. All right. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. So far, we've been building up to slightly more and more complex models. And this one's gonna be uh, a serious model here, all right? This is a, a universal joint drive shaft, all right? I've got input on the right-hand side, a cruciform carbon joint on the right, a telescoping shaft in the middle, and the opposite on the other side, which will power whatever mechanism it's supposed to on the left. I've got points to ground hidden here because I need to orient it in space. But to illustrate just how complex the system is, I'm going to just animate the drive shaft. And you can see that this is a fully articulating mechanistic system. All right. Now, I'm not saying that it couldn't be done in other simulation tools, but I am saying that setting up this model would be difficult. All right. Had it not been. I was just going to say that people out there who've done this type of thing in, the, in FEA before, I mean, this is not, we're not talking about doing this in a rigid body dynamics. This is a, a full deformable FEA here. They would be shaking in their shoes a little bit, I, I think, uh, because I've done these sorts of models in other tools and it would not be something that you would attempt to do live, uh, you know, in a, you know, in the next five minutes. <laughs> All right. Well, what I am going to attempt in the next five minutes is to not only simulate it, but show you how cleverly we've inter, uh, uh, informed ourselves of these interactions. All right. I'm going to go back to the simulation panel uh, that we've been using already. And I'm going to go down to the very bottom where I can show connections. If I check this box, it does the same pre-processing step that we did before we run any simulation. But right now, it's just looking for the interactions between bodies. Okay. When it comes back, it's going to illustrate for me a color-coded set of all of the areas where two parts are touching and made it together. And I can say, okay, I'm locked out on the left-hand side. This is the worst-case scenario, so I'm fastened to the ground. I've got revolute joints in between all of these cruciform areas. And indeed, I have a slider between the telescoping end. And I didn't have to individually click any of these contacting faces whatsoever. It just figured it out for me. Now, this is all well and good once your uh, assembly is already defined, but no one starts with a fully defined assembly. So what happens when I'm still just building this up? To illustrate that, I'm going to kind of go back in time and suppress one of these mates. Once that happens, the assembly definition has changed. So, of course, on shape simulation updates, and it's going to show me the new contact pairs. And right in the middle, I see a bright red indication saying that these two parts are close they're touching one another there's probably an interaction that should be going on but you haven't told me any one so i'm going to tell you there's a, a red area and this is a big sign for me that i have to add some information to the model now i could go and define it as i had before with a mate or i could use a different default setting than the two that you've already seen one is to use mates one is to bond everything one is to use the information we have in the mates and then bond the rest. And that looks like this. And I find this to be most helpful as I'm building up the simulation assembly because I can start working from something that works straight out of the box and add fidelity as I go. Yeah. Yeah, this one's no joke. This this simulation here that Chris and Chris is showing is, is no joke to set up in in other systems and in fact this, this is a perfect example if you just bonded everything together it would be uh, completely useless and you'd get no you'd get no information about the load transfer um, uh, 
and you know there's some questions coming in about some of the the FEA behind this so I will I'll pause on on those questions and I, I will get to them in a minute but um, yeah all right last thing I want to show here on this model is that again you still have all of the tools that you're used to that telescoping midsection is hollow so I might want to take a section view of it but I can do that as it's still mid solve. All right. I can highlight in here. Maybe I want, I did like, uh, you know, the Virtus color scheme. And maybe I want to drag this down and highlight some other regions. Everything's looking fine in here. But I got some hot spots uh, in the cruciform area. Okay. Now there's one last uh, model that we'd like to showcase for you. I know it's close to Greg's heart. Uh, Greg, do you want me to pass it back to you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right. Here it comes. So this is is uh, is more of the same, but just getting, I guess, like orders of uh, order of magnitude more uh, more superpowers. <laughs> this is a a very interesting brake caliper, and um, I'm going to just play with it a little bit inside on shape. Now you can see here there's a lot of connections you know defined through mates. So some of these are cylindrical, some of these are revolutes. Uh, there might be a sliding one somewhere. There's some fasten mates, absolutely for sure. Um, and if I pull on this top, I'm not sure how well this will come out in the animation on, uh, I can see it is actually, it's, it's, it's basically real time for me here, uh, but through the, the webcast, it might look a little bit chunkier. Anyway, I can see that this is a mechanism. So this is not ready for, uh, this is not ready for simulation because as like one of the questions is, is already asking, and maybe Chris is a good time to, to uh, answer that is that this is linear static analysis. Um, so static being the operative word there, <laughs> it, things need to be in a static state before we can uh, uh, before we can get you know valid results on them. This is not currently in that state. Uh, so I'll make it that way through normal on shape techniques. Um, but firstly, I'm going to show you another thing that again proves that on shape simulation is on shape. I'm going to uh, open up my named positions panel, which was something we introduced earlier this year as well in this year of the product um, extravaganza that we had. Now, the, the named positions, I have saved a particular position for all of this to be in called breaking. And if I apply it, it's actually going to snap everything into the correct location or orientation. And then I'm going to just say that these two carriers down here will be fixed. So now this is in a static state uh, for me to go ahead and, and do the analysis. Um, so I've got equal and opposite loads on where the ends of the cable and the cable housing would be. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I like using this. Uh, I know Chris, you always use up here, but I like using the, the simulation results uh, straight out of here. Um, so let, let's have a look at this. And while this is solving, we don't have to stop and just stare at the screen because I'm not taxing my computer at all. We're using cloud native services for this. Uh, we haven't you know, assembled everything into a batch job and thrown it up to some, somebody else's computer. This is a true native uh, cloud service, um, how this is working. So you know, let's see some results already starting to come back in. I'm a little bit concerned about 250 megapascals down here. Um, it, is, it is deforming in the right way. Okay, so that's good. Uh, the other thing I do want to show you is uh, with bills of materials. But this came out of left field, didn't it? Uh, because I'm supposed to give, be giving you a simulation demonstration. And in the end, I give you a, an on-shape um, <laughs> assembly demonstration. But on-shape simulation is on-shape, uh, so here we are. Um, I can look at the bill of materials, and I can actually see the material <laughs> that each component is made of uh, right here. And if I wanted to edit this, um, I could just double click on that material and change the, uh, the material from my library. Uh, there was a question about material libraries. And that is something, yes, we've added uh, the, uh, the necessary properties to um, a material library that you can use with uh, simulation. So these brass, uh, all these metals and plastics and, and, and things like that have been uh, already taken care of in, in, the, uh, in the material library. 
So again, nothing extra that you have to do. You just continue using parts, uh, materials assigned in the part studio and, and everything was good. So we've finished the simulation. And I think that is, <laughs> you've seen the whole thing. I mean, you saw how long it took to solve. Uh, you saw me manipulating it around. You've seen the bills and material and the name positions and how many other things that, um, that you can do in Onshape. Um, something else perhaps, and Chris is ready for this, I know. Um, let's look at an exploded view. So of course, exploded views work with Onshape simulation because exploded views are part of Onshape. And I, I won't say it again. Uh, but, but of course they work and they're very, very useful. Uh, in fact, you can animate this as well. Um, you didn't know you needed to do that before today, did you? That you'd have animated exploded views of stress results in, inside your browser. Um, that's pretty incredible. Uh, you know, we can bring all of this stuff together. We can look at the bill of materials and the exploded view together, of, of course, because that all is um, just on shape. And I did want to show you this, uh, these connections because, you know, Chris demonstrated that with the drive shaft and, and the interesting, uh, you know, that slide, that slip joint in the middle of the, uh, of the drive shaft. Um, but when you see it on a model like this, you get to see why this is so exciting for us. Um, normally putting something like this together would be so difficult to get your mind around and, and keep track of. Uh, yet I can really isolate it down to just the, uh, the mates that I'm interested in, the revolutes. Okay, all of these things are revolutes. I've got this little piece of wire here, but on the other end of the piece of wire is a, a cylindrical. Okay, so now I can verify that my revolutes and cylindrical are all good together. There's a bunch of things that are fastened together. Um, but the one that Chris pointed out earlier as well was is equally important, which is the things that are touching or very, very, very close to touching, but are not connected. And this is just a sanity check again for me to know that this washer is not going to be welded shut to the uh, to the things on either side of of, of that um, so i think that that is uh, you know that's really really exciting to be able to do this and to be able to show um, you know how yeah. this can work so naturally so intuitively uh, with on shape simulations so greg while you had the bill of materials open we had a couple questions come through asking if we if users could define their own simulation materials Oh, yes, yes, of course. So, um, bills of material go into here. You can actually create a custom material, of course, add it to a custom library. You can create your own custom library just like you can uh, with Onshape. In fact, the, the material library is the same as Onshape was before, just with a lot more line items in it. Previously, you just had name and density. Now you've got Poisson's ratio, Young's modulus, and a bunch of different uh, strengths, um, and, you know, limit stresses, and, and other things in there. And this is how, of course, uh, we can create the safety factor plots because we know what the uh, this yield, uh, tensile yield stress um, strength is here. Uh, and yeah, so yes, I, I know there's a ton of questions, and and I'm there's one more that I can answer through demonstration, and then I perhaps we'll just leave the screen up and, and get to get to as many of these questions as we can. Um, there's this really, really interesting and bonus uh, that I can talk about today. And it's part of the previous release of Onshape, uh, which we called release 154, came out last Monday. Every three weeks we release Onshape. Uh, you know, we've had uh, 14 releases already this year. Uh, and in the last release we had, we introduced something called publications. Now a publication is a new object type, a really high level object type in, um, in Onshape. So we've previously, we've had documents like this. This is a document, um, you know, and a document contain different elements like parts, uh, like drawings, like assemblies. But a publication allows you to bring together any of those elements into one publication that you want to share with people. So you share a publication in the same way that you share anything else. You can add people with view or edit access. You can comment on publications, but it's got some other really, really interesting things. You can create an area down here where you can make uh, like text comment that's marked a uh, markdown area. Uh, so I can hide or show that, uh, that text comment area. Then I can just add different document tabs, which is to say, a part studio, an assembly, uh, or maybe a PDF that I had from part of another document. And these are all coming from different sources. 
And now I've created this kind of read-only environment where I can share perhaps, um, you know, this V5, this is the version five of the document that I'm going to be sharing. This is the version two of the drive shaft that I'm going to be sharing. And because I have uh, access to simulation, um, then the results are available to me in this read-only form. This is really, really exciting because I can, um, I can animate this, I can you know, query all the stresses, I can do everything interactively like I was showing you uh, before, um, but it's in this read-only environment, like, uh, and, and it's just, just so easy to share and, and, and collaborate with people um, in, uh, in the same way that we would be doing this with things other than simulations, right? So yeah, the publications uh, really just, it's just came out as well, and immediately it's of use and, and really um, sparking a lot of interest for the, the simulation users within our uh, within our pool. Okay, so we have not enough time to answer all of these questions, but I'm going to quickly um, rip down a few of them. When will it be available for pro users? So we have released this uh, initially for our enterprise users with the intent that we will uh, follow up um, as soon as we can, uh, basically, with uh, pro users. So we're uh, monitoring how the, the service is going and we'll be making that decision um, presently. Um, okay, so yeah, groups work with simulation as well do mates and, and other things. That's a good one. Uh, can Onshape simulate fluid flow? Chris? Uh, not presently, but uh, we do intend to use this simulation platform to over time enrich with more and more simulation solvers. So what you see today is not the extent of what Onshape will have in years to come, uh, but it is very powerful for where it stands today. Okay. So uh, there's a question here that somebody was really specific to one of the early demonstrations we did. Which faces did you fix? Now, the answer to that is probably we didn't pick an individual face to fix. We actually picked a body. And that goes back to the comment I made. We want to keep things very physical. Uh, you don't, we don't necessarily need to use the old school abstractions um, that have been around since the days of Nastran, of course. Now, anything I say is not a slight at any of those tools like Nastran, Abacus, Ansys. Um, there's an absolute place for this. Um, this is not that place. <laughs> this is a designer embedded decision support tool which is used alongside of you creating those ribs, creating those gussets, and just answering the questions like I showed, should this rib or gusset even be there? Can I get an instant interactive feedback on that? I'm not saying that this situation, that this, this simulation product is, uh, is a replacement for uh, high-end multi-physics verifications. Uh, you know, there, there's tools for that. There's very, very good tools for that. And in fact, many of those good tools are very good partners uh, of Onshape and PTC. And we continue that, um, that as our strategy for offering the full range of simulation. Um, another one for you, Chris. Sure. Uh, can we see historic results, historical results as we make modifications and regenerate new models? Well, the, the best way to do that is to work with uh, Onshape's caching system. So as Greg actually demonstrated a number of times, if you make an update to a converged result and get a new result, all you have to do is click that back button and you'll go back to the last previous result. Uh, that works whether or not you're setting up a difference in the assembly or a difference in the part studio, it'll just refresh. Right. And in fact, you know, to build on that, um, versions uh, and branching are absolutely supported because it's just part of Onshape. So if you want to create a version somewhere to, to put a stake in the ground, uh, maybe go off on a branch or multiple branches. You can do that, and you know the setup um, that uh, that you have for those particular branches will be maintained in those branches. So then you can come back at any time. Um, so maybe Chris, can you give us a little bit of a rundown? And I've, I'm paraphrasing a couple of questions here uh, sure. about the, the basis of the simulation. Um, sure. So I think I mentioned it's linear static analysis. No secret there. Right, no secret there. Uh, it is a finite element analysis, so yes. no secret there as well, which means we are running a mesh underneath the hood. Uh, it is obviously a meshless uh, user experience, so the way we get around that 
actually, is we use an immersed meshing scheme. That allows us to implicitly infer these interactions between adjacent parts and apply rule sets for those overlapping or coincident uh, cell elements. And I saw a uh, question in the chat saying, is there a way to set that tolerance or to uh, inspect that tolerance? And actually, the best way to do that is to use the show connections tool because it'll show you exactly where things believe they will be touching um, for you. So you don't have to have things completely coincident and overlapping, little gaps are fine, but best to check. Yep. Uh, is it possible to visualize the FE mesh? No. Uh, right. we, we, oh, no, that answers the question. So sure. you've answered the question, <laughs> right. No, seriously, um, we don't see the need or the, the uh, you know, there's no need to visualize that mesh. Uh, the approach we use um, is not the same as, uh, you know, an H mesh or conformal mesh that you might have used in NASTRAN or ANSYS or, or some of those other tools. Um, we want to keep people focused on the design, the engineering, the, the, the meaningfulness of what they're actually simulating, uh, rather than uh, those other those other approaches which require you know more um, hand control over those things. Yeah. Uh, I think you did show sectional views. Yes. Um, there's a question here that I quickly want to answer. Why did you have to use a separate browser window? That refers to the demonstration that when we were collaborating, I did want to show two browser windows. Right. Because I wanted to keep one looking at the assembly, which is where the simulation was being shown, but I also wanted to follow Chris. And the interesting thing is that I could have been following it on my phone, but I couldn't really project the screen very well from my phone. Um, it was just a, a demo uh, necessity to show this in the demo. Of course, you could. Um, you can have as many different browsers as you like, obviously. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions. On those mates? Sorry. Okay. Well, that that uh, I'm seeing a lot of questions about the roadmap friction elements being one of them. Um, yep. Simulation is not is a broad and deep uh, you know practice. So there's a lot that we can add. Uh, Linear static structural analysis is the bread and butter of any mechanical engineer. So it's a great place to start. Yep. I don't think I'm teasing too much to say that our first next big improvement will be in modal analysis and those two will go hand in hand with one another. Beyond yep. that, you should expect small enhancements over time before we get to bigger things like thermal or fluids that will require extra UI and UX. In fact, there's no intention of creating another general FEA tool here. No. There's enough very, very good ones out there uh, on the market. And again, I'll say that we partner with those people and that's fantastic. We're not trying to create another general FEA tool here. We want to create a tool which is genuinely useful uh, for designers to use intrinsically as part of the design process. So it's a decision support tool for them there. It's a different sort of thing. Um, entirely so you know we're not just looking at the tick list of all possible physics and all possible icons and buttons that we could add to this that's not on our roadmap uh, we are going to obviously focus on things that are most useful uh, for that target uh, the designers i think at this point we should wrap it up uh, because you know there's there must be another hundred questions here it's uh it, it's it's great, and I, I want to thank everybody for um, for their input onto this. I'm just going to uh, to show you something. Um, here it should be should be coming up now. Actually, are you showing the screen? Or am I? Oh, there it is. <laughs> it took a while to come up. I want to thank everybody for spending the hour with us today. Uh, it's been great experience for Chris and I to uh, to talk like this. Uh, we're really proud of what we've got at this first release of the product. We're proud of and excited about what will happen. Um, for your questions that did not get answered yet, we will uh, we'll take them offline. Uh, we have your contact details. Uh, we'll make those questions, those answers available to you. So once again, thank you for all your time today, and we hope you uh, get to try a simulation soon. And uh, we're looking forward to your feedback. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.